Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. Titanic is back. Digitally upgraded with new 3D motion field technology. I'm the king of the world! You can feel the action. Now, with more monsters and an up to date soundtrack. In cooperation with George Lucas. J.J. Abrams. <laughs> and Michael Bay. <laughs> Titanic. Super 3D. Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 75. I'm Tom Mary. Oh, my God. I'm up for your lack of enthusiasm with too much enthusiasm. Good morning, Tom. How are you? I'm a little hungover, Brian, I have to admit. No, I'm, I'm good, actually. Uh, I, I don't know why I got all Walter Cronkite on you there. Uh, was That's that Cronkite right. or was that more Edward R. Murrow? I felt it was very Dan Rather. Well, I tell you what... Uh, I'll, I'm excited because we have a guest with us today. Back on the show, Ms. Eva Snyder, visual effects artist. Hello. Woo! Responsible Hello. for the entire success of the Avengers. <laughs> oh, if only. <laughs> uh, thanks be, for joining us. Uh, to do person. Good to have you back. And uh, I, that opening video with the Titanic thing, I was rolling my eyes at. I was like, oh, this is kind of dumb. Oh, yeah, so he got shot, because the, and there's some ice cubes. But then as soon as they, uh, they brought in J.J. Abrams and just right. slapped up a bunch of lens flares, I'm still a sucker right. for that joke. I, it'll is get it, old someday, but... It's, it, it, I'm sure it will get old, but it's like there's already youngsters for, for whom, like, they're like, oh, I get it. If it's Michael Bay, it's got to be an explosion joke. If it's, you know, J.J. Uh, Abrams, it's a lens flare joke. If it's George Lucas, it's adding in crap nobody wanted in the movie to begin with joke. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's uh, I, it was well executed. That was on the front page of Reddit a while ago, um, a couple of weeks ago. The, the original opening video I wanted to do was sent in by Bill Meeks. And apparently, like the actors from Breaking Bad have gotten into endorsing individual students during a student election. And so uh, Walter White, like, vaguely threatens people of what will happen if they vote for the student that Gus Fring was was. Uh, was endorsing, but that video is private now, so they they pulled that down. Now I saw you laughing at this uh, this video, this opening video, Eva, and you're you're a visual effects artist. Are, is, are there visual effects jokes, or are you just laughing at the same stuff we were laughing at? Well, I mean, it's the same sort of thing where it's the big explosions and the the lens flares and everything. And I hadn't seen that video, so for me, it was a, a fresh viewing, so it's rather entertaining. Yeah, it was fresh for me too, actually. Uh, what also is fresh is our big story. <laughs> This just in, the big story. You know, I used to think it took too long for that graphic to play, but the longer we use it, Brian, the yeah. longer I think it should be. <laughs> well, it's good because it's like I was able to go up and fix myself a drink and yeah. sit back down during that. You just take a little me time. That's very mad men of you. Oh, wait, you don't watch that. Uh, let's talk about Comcast. 
we got a couple of, of related stories here today. An executive from Sony uh, said last week that concerns about Comcast's discriminatory data cap are giving Sony, big old Sony, second thoughts about launching an internet video service that would compete with cable and satellite TV services. So Sony is like, you know, we're thinking about this, doing the thing that everybody wants. We're Sony, right? We've got so the wherewithal, we got the power. But if we come out with some online video service that brings you cable television over the internet, we're worried about this Comcast data cap thing that's just going to crush us. So this is amazing because the whole reason for data caps to begin with was because it was – you would – I say the whole reason. Obviously, there's a million reasons. But one of the lines that was sold is that it's the pirates that are eating up all the bandwidth for the little guy. It's these hogs that are ruining the experience. But then here we are four or five years later, and all of a sudden, digital distribution is a very legitimate uh, enterprise and all of a sudden there's tons of money to be made you have the success of netflix your hulus and uh and uh you know your your revision threes your your uh, youtubes and now all of a sudden it's like whoa 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 there's money so maybe we shouldn't just randomly you know keep on capping and telling people that they're bad people for using the product and or service that they pay for well but comcast isn't saying that comcast is saying actually that cap works great for us because you know what we're doing? We're providing you video on demand through your internet connection that we don't count against the data cap. Right. Well, and we had talked about this on frame rate before, and the consensus seemed to be like, oh, no, it's totally different. This is a totally different service. It's not internet. It's just video on demand. And we happen to use the internet in order to deliver it. So, Well, uh, now Telecom Ramblings has a report that Dan Rayburn and Brian Berg have detailed uh, – have taken a detailed look at the actual data being transferred on Comcast to find out, is it true that this is not leaving their network and it's totally different from the uh, the outside? Bits from Xfinity, bits from Netflix, MLB, and some other sources differ in their quality of service tag. The former are high-priority CS5. That's the bits from Xfinity. The latter, the ones from Netflix, are low-priority CS1. So what they're saying is, look, this doesn't mean Comcast is slowing anyone down, but Comcast traffic at some point is coming into the same pool of bandwidth that Netflix's traffic is coming into, coming into your house, and then getting prioritized over Netflix's traffic. Do you think we have an inevitable inevitable uh, trend towards consolidation. I mean, every time when there was radio, everybody learned to do radio. There's a billion stations. And then now here we are 100 years later, we're consolidated to pretty much just um, a clear channel. And on television, you know, theoretically, anyone could, could broadcast. Although th th I guess it did get very diverse during the cable era of the 70s. But even that, we're seeing massive consolidation. Is the internet just doomed? To have that same kind of media consolidation and become a dumb pipe. Yeah, Eva, what do you what do you think? I, I, a lot of folks feel like we're headed down that road Brian just described, where the internet's just going to be dominated and turned into a walled garden, like a few AOLs is the future of the internet. And other folks are saying, no, 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 that'll never happen. I don't know if it'll be quite that extreme, but it's definitely interesting when you start getting like you know Comcast and NBC being together, and the it's that distribution versus content. Um, and as long as they're fighting each other, it kind of works out in that um, nobody's controlling everything. But once you start, like that's where the neutrality stuff comes in, that, that then, uh, you know, who's prioritizing their own content? So we'll have to see, I guess. I, I think it's, it's been a slow motion uh, disaster that we've been watching <laughs> for the past six years. <laughs> Though it knew is coming, and I'm still, I, maybe I'm a little Pollyanna, but I still believe that the open internet will come up out, out on top, like it has every other time we face this sort of thing. Well, what I think is in play, just to give you a little historical perspective, five years ago when Comcast put the 250 gigabyte cap in, I wasn't too upset because I'm like, look, at right now, 250 gigabytes is plenty. Uh, so, so I'm not going to complain too much if they're just using that so they can, they can have a, a, something written down that says, okay, if we're going to go after the worst offenders, we're going to write down exactly what the worst offender is. But I said if they don't adjust that cap going forward and if they start exempting their own services, there's going to be trouble. And here and we so are, five years later, they have not adjusted the cap. On the one hand, we have Sony saying, you know what, 250 gigabytes is not enough for us to be able to start a video service on the open internet and have Comcast subscribers be able to use it. That's troubling to us. So there's alarm bell number one. And this is what I've been counting on, big companies coming in and saying, 
actually, no, that's not okay for you to have this bandwidth cap. And then Comcast, on the other hand, saying, hey, we've prioritized our own service. But it, it isn't on the open net network. And some experts coming in and going, well, it's pretty much the same thing. You're not right. running this over a VLAN like you are your video that comes in for Comcast Cable TV. You're running it maybe on a different pipe on your end, but by the time it comes to the curb where the bottleneck is, it's sitting there right next to the Netflix bits, and you're prioritizing your bits over Netflix's, and that is exactly what everyone was fearing that you would do. Now, is this a good thing? Because finally we have a moneyed interest interested in shutting down bandwidth caps, which consumers all universally seem to hate. Yeah, I, th and I, I think that's what has to happen, right? Uh, I think we ha I was always thinking Google would be the first one to wade in because they, they have historically liked to, to look like sure. the good guy and fight the good fight. And I'm not saying they won't still come well, in. But, but also, you know, with YouTube, of course, they're delivering, you know, high quality HD streams and, and could be exactly. obviously YouTube use is nowhere near the amount of data use you get from like a Netflix type situation. But, uh, but you know, I would have thought the same thing as well. And, and But I'm surprised to see Sony as the first one to speak up. That's, that's good. I, yeah, sure. I mean, and, and that's the thing. Everybody says, well, you know, the, the companies will never change their bandwidth caps. There's not enough competition for us as consumers to put the pressure on them. But, and that may be true in the United States especially. But I think we will see pressure come from these big companies. Uh, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that the Sony story didn't get more pickup. Uh, yeah, to be honest, the first time and only time that I found it was when you had placed it in the dock. So that was a really good grab on there. I'm glad that too. That's why frame rate exists, Tom, is where the rest of the meat is trying to shut you down. It's the man and we're the woman. And that actually brings <laughs> us to another big story. What did you just say? Yeah, that's the, the, the <laughs> another big story is that I'm a woman and go. Stop everything. It's another big story. So Daniel Frankel on Paid Content had an interesting story uh, that says, look, with things like TV everywhere, with broadband usage caps, the cable industry is actually shooting itself in the foot. He makes the argument that uh, Time Warner, AT&T, Verizon, in their latest quarterly earnings reports, uh, sh you know, showed that they're making more money off of people using the Internet. Uh, and Comcast needs to pay attention to that. Uh, the faster bandwidth consumption escalates, the better the cable industry is positioned, according to BTIG Research's uh, Richard Greenfield. With an increasing number of IP-enabled devices on the net, in the home, all the time, consumers will demand increasingly robust bandwidth and be willing to pay for it. He's arguing, look, you guys have continually been able to charge us more for faster bandwidth over the years, and now you're trying to stop us from using the internet? What you should be doing is encouraging us to use as much as possible and sell us even faster connections. Absolutely. So here's what's interesting. Normally, we talk in terms of parallels of what happened in television before, or what happened in radio even. But this is a case where I think we're seeing a trend that uh, that mirrors what happened with te uh, with cellular cable or cellular telephone companies, where when when the iPhone launched, there was a lot of worry because none of the once you you got like unlimited data subscriptions from AT and T, the you still are feeling a fight as the cell phone companies are trying to push back against becoming dumb pipes. For the longest time, they didn't want to be dumb pipes, but now they're at a point where it's like, well, clearly everyone just wants to have a data plan and be able to use it as much as possible, and so they're relaxing, and you're getting fantastic quality LTE services, and uh, and the rollout is happening all over the United States, all over the world. I think, likewise, these cable companies don't want to become dumb pipes of data, and they're going to push back. I think we're going to see four years of this kind of maneuvering, of this kind of idiocy, and, the, and them continuing to try to convince us that what we want is a channel-based, all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, and then finally, I think they're going to crumble just like the, the rest of the world realize, wow, the more bandwidth everyone used, the more we could charge, and the better off that, uh, that, that we all are. And this is where they are right now. Comcast pro profit gained 30 uh, percent this last quarter. Now, some of that has to do with buying NBC Universal and getting the benefits of having a Super Bowl broadcast. Uh, but if you look at the cable part of the company, video subscribers declined for the sixth consecutive quarter, although slowed. Uh, they lost 37,000 subscribers. Now, that means they're, they're business of forcing you to buy cable television is is at least flat if you want to be optimistic 
Right. And well, their yes, business um, creating Lost content Earth. with NBC Universal is, you know, doing okay, or at least flat, if you want to be negative. Uh, and their and their business of selling you internet is is great. So the, the, you you position it perfectly. What we're open for right now is competition. Somebody to come in and just wipe the slate clean. What the paid content article points out is none of these telcos can compete right now because DSL is nowhere near what cable is available for. And wireless just isn't there yet. LTE is fast, but it's not as fast and it's not as reliable yet. So really, they should be consolidating right now instead of trying to reduce our consumption. Absolutely. Eva, what, what, Eva, what do you, where, where do you fall on this? Where do you see this going? Yeah, well, um, I definitely agree. I mean, it's again, it's that mix of of providing content and will they like because everyone wants their own content to do well. So um, it's sort of a like as long as they can control how much you're essentially allowed to view, they're not thinking about it. I think forward enough, and that's it's going back to like the Sony stuff where now they're they're going to spend this time getting pressured to say open up the caps or charge more for that because in the long term that's going to help them they want more revenue anyways so it's definitely looking like you know everyone's going to end up with tiered internet in the future yeah. and and i think what's happening and i think what the paid content columnist uh was pointing out is comcast is about to make all the same mistakes aol did like oh we have a dominant position let's lock it off wall it up and limit access and you know what that does that kills your business well, and understand like that kind of sensibility makes sense in the industrial age, but we are we are still continuing to grow. This is such a wild west frontier, and it's and it's so uh, the the roadmap for progress is just getting faster and faster and faster to where there is uh, you you can't take a walled off approach of we've got ours, let's lock it down with these virtual goods. You have to have a foot race mentality where you are always trying to outrun the rest of the competition and you use your your position advantage to run faster forward, not to stop moving and make sure you hold on to all your monies. Running, Comcast isn't even exercising. They're sitting on the couch <laughs> eating Cheetos. Collecting their paychecks. Apologies to Cheeto in the chat room. Uh, Let's move on to yet another big story that has nothing to do with this sort of stuff. Change topics. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. And for some reason, uh, my reaction to moving on to another big story was to close the story. Okay, here it is. Boxfish plans to revolutionize real-time TV search. Uh, It's a Silicon Valley startup that uses the closed captioning that is broadcast along with programs as text that they can index just the way Google indexes the web and provide a real-time search so that you could say like, hey, I wonder what's uh, going on with Mitt Romney right now. And it'll say, oh, they're talking about him on CNN and Bravo and these five channels. Would you like to change the channel right now? So there are there's two ways to look at this. The, the thing, things that positive are for very, very micro niche things for example your own name imagine having a if you're if you're a minor celebrity or whatever you could do the equivalent of a google alert on television people talking about you or if you have a favorite author who very rarely does interviews oh are you looking up brian brushwood (laughs) yeah there there was no mentions of brian brushwood right now on tv sorry man but uh but like for example you know if you're a fan of a particular author or or an obscure actor or whatever you know that's that's what i loved about my original tivo was that i set up a bunch of people to follow back when nobody knew who jack black was and i was a tremendous tenacious d fan and i knew that you know kate like that's how i found out he was going to be on saturday night live was because a tivo alert popped up and so it automatically recorded Saturday Night Live just because he was on it. And likewise, there are certain authors, when they do their book tours, they appear on several different talk shows to promote their books, and it would automatically record all of those. Those those days were great. That was awesome. And that's what I hope I could get from this. On the flip side, though, the number one value, it seems, to this, to, they're pushing the real-time Twitter-like capability. And the problem is, is most of the programming on television is not live. It's pre-recorded. In which case, you know, I, I don't know what the value is to real time knowing which episode of Unwrapped on the Food Network is playing or whatever. And uh, uh, likewise, for the live content for your CNN, there, there's what, like maybe eight, ten 
news networks on cable that you really got to focus on. And the problem is on the closed closed captioning, if you watch those, half the words are misspelled because they have some poor guy smoking cigarettes typing as fast as he well, can. A lot of the time it's, uh, it's speech recognition. Yeah. For live gyp- programs. <laughs> Whatever well, it is. So it's how accurate. how is this implemented? Because I know that it, like the article mentions about using it on your iPad and then you can change the channels from your iPad to your TV. Like I'm not like it seems like a really interesting way to to find content and watch stuff on your TV, but I'm not really sure how this impl- is it a smart TV thing? Like I was having trouble figuring out where well, a, where that lies. Uh, it's a startup, so I think it's just the engine right now. And then the the future possibility is for stuff like uh, having it built into your smart TV or your smart TV or, or Google TV or your Apple TV or whatever comes down the road. But for right now, I think it's all in the proof of concept stage. At least that's what I understand it as. Uh, in six to eight weeks, some cable subscribers in the U.S. will be able to use the feed, uh, Boxfish Live, and interact with their TV uh, through that. The way I understand it is what they want to do, and I'm not sure if they've got this done yet. What they want to do is have an app on a phone or an iPad, and then you use that to change the channels. So this is similar to it. There's a lot of other apps that do this where you have a dongle or, or something connected to Wi-Fi that can receive uh, the information from your phone, and then it has an IR blaster that will change the channel for you. And I think this would work the same way. It just, you know, you, you, you'll be on the iPad looking at Boxfish Live and say, oh, okay, uh, there's that biography of Rachel Ray I was looking for. Why, let's, let's go to that right now, and then it'll just change the channel for you. Yeah, this is the kind of thing, it's sort of like Twitter. Even if you don't figure out how to make money with it at the outset, it just seems like it's a big enough and interesting enough idea that I'm glad somebody's doing it. And, you know, obviously Twitter, we discovered long after its launch all the unique and, and precious and important ways it could affect uh, affect our lives. And, like, I suspect this could be a big deal like that. I just don't know how, but I'm glad they're doing it. All right, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor on Frame Rate. This episode brought to you by Audible.com. Uh, Audible is, of course, the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 and growing every second. Downloadable titles, they have fiction, they have nonfiction, all types of literature. And listeners of Frame Rate can get a free book. If you haven't tried Audible yet, go right now, audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate, and download an absolutely free book. Audiobooks are great. They allow you to read when you're doing other stuff. I, I read this week because I was um, changing some, re- rearranging some stuff in the bedroom and then I was vacuuming. And it actually made me want to do more of the things on my to do list and get them out of the way because I wanted to keep listening to the book. Yeah, I find myself driving longer. I look forward to business trips. Like, I, in the last two weeks, get this. People are like, oh, I'd love to read. I just don't have time. Dude, you got tons of time. Your brain's sitting there idle. You're in screensaver mode whenever you're doing tedium, and you could be having adventures. For example, right now, I am listening to the Iron Druid Chronicles. This is about a 2,100-year-old druid who uh, has survived by blending in with modern society and basically uh, keeping up to date with all the latest cultural touchstones so that nobody realizes he's an old-ass druid. So he talks in terms of Star Wars references. He makes Simpsons jokes, and he's got a... It's it's uh, it's really cool. He's got a talking dog. Uh, well, psychic dog. It's a dog that he's psychically bound to. There's a lot of ass-kicking, and he kills gods. He, he kills he, gods? You're making this up d- now. No, no. He uh, he gets in... He gets in his, his lawyers. He's got a werewolf for a lawyer and a vampire for a lawyer, which is kind of ironic. Uh, and he's got uh, what else? He he's got a, he's got a beef with a with a Celtic god that wants him dead because he stole his sword like thousands of years ago. It's a lot of fun. It's way good. Listen to it for free. Any of the one credit books on Audible are yours for free to try out the service if you haven't already, or tell someone else who, if you're an Audible fan. Hey, you can get a book for free. Go to audiblepodcast.com/slash/framerate and get a free audio book of your choice. And we thank you, f- Audible. For providing awesome audiobooks and for supporting frame rate. And now it is time for the slipstream. Lots of lots of little things and a couple big things to talk about. Uh, YouTube is committing two hundred million dollars to their premium channels. These are the ones that have been rolling out uh, slowly, but the the upfronts have been happening in New York over the past week. We talked about that before. And YouTube had uh, Jay Z, Flo Rita, 
Neon Trees, Julia Stiles, and Eric Schmidt on stage together now, again for the first time. Uh, this is unveiling their campaign across Google's content network to push out these channels that they've been funding. They this doubles their investment on this, right? Because their initial investment was two hundred million to begin with for the programming. Now they're doubling down with two hundred million more to legitimize it. Uh, and I think this is very big for online content. Chris Hardwick, uh, host of The Nerdist, said the web will be to cable TV what cable TV was to broadcast. Oh, well, that's newsflash. That's uh, <laughs> very insightful, Chris. Well, well spoken, sir. You know, there's still people out there that, that that's the first time they've heard that. Also, cars go fast. And <laughs> also, see also fire hot. <laughs> anyway, I just thought, thought we'd mention that that's, uh, you know, the upfronts are now being invaded by the folks on the web. Hulu was there, Netflix was there, YouTube was there. Uh, it's, it's, it's all happening. Also, we have traditional television continuing to buy the new folks. And, of course, Revision 3 uh, was purchased by Discovery. We mentioned the rumor about that last week, and it did happen. Uh, so now Brian Brushwood is a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, no, you're not. You're, 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 you're so a I'm contractor. A uh, is what it you're, you're what? I'm a shill for the man. You're a shill for, for, for the man. But corporate what's the mood at Revision 3? Uh, oh, dude. He's excited. I mean, I'm I'm in it as I as I made clear on this week at Tech. I'm on the outside. I'm an I'm an outside contractor with them, so I'm not really an employee. So it's like I'm not getting any kind of payday out this. However, I am extremely excited about having an internal line to start pitching uh, bigger shows. There's a number uh, for the last five years. Uh, I've 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 pitched a number of projects with TV groups, uh, but but TV is such an agonizing industry to work with because you'll have a perfectly good idea with great talent and excellent scripts. And then they'll say, yeah, but we're going to put you in this primetime time slot, which means you need to figure out how to spend $500,000 more and guarantee 50 times bigger audiences. So, and then everything completely, that's why you get these ridiculous shows that are bigger than they need to be. And what I'm really excited about is being able to pitch internally to Discovery Networks because all, all the talks I've had with Discovery have been phenomenal. They seem to be big fans of, of Brian Brushwood, but, but weirdly, the projects I've been pitching have been too small for primetime television, and so they're just not interested. So hopefully this will be a backdoor for me to start pitch, pitching those same ideas with, uh, with web-centric tweaks to them. Yeah, I used to think that about CBS. Uh, Discovery's head of digital, J.B. Perrette, said, we want them to continue doing what they're doing and to continue developing native digital talent. Uh, so essentially saying, we're not going to come in and shut them down. We're not going to steal other people uh, and move them to Discovery. We bought them because we like Revision 3 and we want to add them to the family. Eva, I, as a viewer, as a consumer of, of online content, how does this make you feel when you see one of the indies, one of the strong indies, get bought up by the bigger cable company? Well, I guess one of my things is, isn't $30 million kind of low? Like, it seems, not to, like, rain on anyone's parade because it's a lot of money, but, like, $30 million in the grand scheme, scheme of things seems like not a lot of money, I guess, for for this kind of purchase. It's and, all um, relative, right? I mean, it, it, Gray, <laughs> yeah, right. Gray, Greylock's uh, getting their money back. Uh, Jay Adelson, Kevin Rose, some of the other founders, they're, they're going to they're gonna get a nice little chunk of money. There might be a little bit going to other f folks in the option, but you're right. It's not it's not like, you know, woo, they're all millionaires now. <laughs> well, right. and, and I'm glad that uh, Brian seems to have a, a positive um, uh, a view of Discovery because it seems like of all the, the big sort of media studio you know, content people, Discovery seems like the old stodgy, like, oh, well, let's get these hip kids to to help us with our website. And um, it's interesting because it seems to be, um, there seems to be some moves of this agent approach to, to web content where where uh, Rev3 and I think like there's a place called The Collective and a couple other small companies that, that they don't, as they're not doing as much internal content content as much as they're acting as agents for whoever is like the cool hip next web people and it's sort of a way it seems like uh, the way record labels sort of treated new like indie bands where they would grab them up and then they'd polish them up and present them to the world of of like the big stage and so it sort of feels like maybe the the old old media people are starting to be like, well, maybe we can make web work for us in this way. Yeah, it's like the Bieber model, right? You go and you yeah. find the raw talent and then you sign them 
you know, and get them get like camera ready and and, and a little bit right. of a little bit of backing, a little bit of promotional out there and turn them into that's, something huge. That's what Google is doing the same way where they're like, we're going to loan you this money and whatever money you make back, you'll pay us off. But then you make everything after that. That's like, here's your first record. Uh, we're going to help you produce it. You'll pay us back for it. And then after that, everything's yours. And so we haven't seen, I guess, what happens to the people who fail at that model. Um, so I guess it's just it's an interesting uh, move from, I guess, the old old media side to see how they're trying to make this work for them. Well, Google is doing it a little differently with YouTube. What they're doing is granting the money to a channel and then YouTube selling the ads against it. So they're banking. It's kind right. of more like the old model of like, OK, we're going to order a season of Lost then we're going to sell a bunch of ads against it. And if we make enough money, we'll, we'll do a season two. Right, but it keeps the risk on Google's side, where it's like we, we perceive that there's talent here. We perceive there's a way to make a buck down the road, and we'll front the money to do it. Hmm. Uh, speaking of Google, Google getting set to invest in Machinima, which uh, gets a billion views a month. Uh, they're not buying it outright, uh, but they are sinking a bunch of money in it. Uh, it's more than just the YouTube channel arrangement. They're actually investing in the company, uh, according to a report from All Things D. Let me make a prediction that I've, that I've talked about before. Uh, people love watching other people play games. And it, I think there is a coming, I don't want to say war, but there's going to be uh, some interesting scuttlebutt when people who make the games realize, wow, millions of dollars are being made by people watching other people play our games, and we're not seeing any of that money. And you you might see some kind of lockdown on what people, most of it is in live streaming right now. If you go to twitch.tv, a uh, friend of the show, uh, Man vs. Game, every single night has thousands of people watching him play different games. And of course, the reason they watch it is because the electricity of him being a funny, engaging, cool guy, and but also they want to experience the game, even if it's vicariously kind of sitting on this virtual couch next to a guy that they virtually know. I There's got to be some point coming up where uh, things get ugly and the game makers want a piece of the action. I I think that's an interesting thought. You're talking specifically about machinima here. Uh, yes. Specifically about this kind of thing like Twitch. I I think that we'll have an uneasy relationship like the music industry has had with radio where there'll be this this back and forth of, yeah, but when we show your video game, that means people are more interested in your video game and more likely to go buy your video game. And some some game companies will buy that. They'll buy that for certain properties and not others. And, and I think you're right. I think we're looking at uh, a, a, a battle and a negotiation. And I'm not sure where it will end up, but I don't think it will end up crushing these things. I think the game companies will realize... Yeah, we don't we don't want to we don't want to squash the machinimas because they have it. They could have squashed them already very easily, and they they have realized the value of them up till now. Yeah, no, and and I, I'm hoping that that safety net of the fact that every time you drive a sixty dollars sale of a game, that's such a big amount of money that you could just write off all of the blatant. Uh, I I don't even know that it's blatant, but uh, uh, the the large scale IP distribution without authorization. Because you know when when I'm live streaming me playing Star Wars: The Old Republic, not only is it Bioware's game, but it's George Lucas's intellectual property, including copyrighted music and copyrighted video that gets played inadvertently as a result of it. So the fact that it just happens to be in a video game somehow makes it okay for the moment? No, question? actually it doesn't. The game companies are allowing it, but this is all part of the grander scheme of needing copyright reform. Yes. Uh, and I don't want to get into this conversation again right now. No, no, uh, but but so all you're talking about is sync rights and visual rights and fair use defenses. Uh, and and we just haven't seen the game companies crack down the way Hollywood Same. television and, and movies have. I'm saying watch for it. Watch for some kind of noise because I'm sure it'll happen. Okay, uh, let's move on to a few quick quick things. Uh, Hulu is making noises that you're going to have to use your Facebook account if you want to do any kind of uh, sharing features. In fact, last month they made changes saying, look, you, you got to log in with Facebook if you want to share and include li friends with your lists and all, all those social features. Does this bother you, Eva? Um, not, it doesn't bother me because I kind of use the Facebook auth for most things anyways. Or I like being able to have a separate um, a separate login for, for things like that, but... Um, I'm also not very social on Hulu, although I am a Hulu subscriber. Um, 
but I, I can see how people would be frustrated, but it also sounds like Hulu's like, eh, this will be easier because they have other things that they want to deal with. I think the fact that you kind of have to opt out of it uh, and the fact that you, if you were signed in with Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo, you just got dropped is one of the things that's got people upset about this. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think overall it's kind of a minor thing. I'm not gonna st- if I'm going to choose to watch something on Hulu, I'm not going to stop watching it just because I would have to use Facebook to tell people about it. I'm just not going to tell anyone about it. I'm going to be do- doing less sharing. Exactly. Uh, HBO Go and Cinemax now updated with Android 4.0 compatibility. No tablet support yet, but just a note there. If you're an Android user, you can now use that on uh, Ice Cream Sandwich. And uh, Watch ESPN has gone live for Comcast Xfinity subs. This was one of the things we talked about with TV Everywhere is Watch ESPN a, at, at a website, watchespn.com, will now kind of work like HBO Go. You can sign in and validate that you are, in fact, a Comcast subscriber and then watch a lot of ESPN content on the web that you couldn't get before. Yeah. Sport, sport, sporty sport, mixed sport. And That's finally, like- <laughs> uh, the uh, Dish Network is using iTunes and Netflix as a negotiating rhetorical tactic in their fight with AMC. Now, this is typical fight. We don't talk about these a lot on frame rate where an MSO like a Dish or a Comcast gets in a, uh, gets in a fight with one of the networks uh, about carriage fees. The network says, we want to raise the fees. And the, the cable provider says, no, we actually would like to lower the fees. And they, they, you know, sometimes they come to an agreement quickly. Sometimes there's a public dust up like there is between Dish and AMC. But what the twist is here is that Dish, let me see if I can find the quote. Um, we have very specific viewer measurement at Ditch, much more granular than somebody like Nielsen. We're able to watch our customer base, and we realize we skew a bit more rural. Between AMC Network's programming, they have very, very low viewership outside of a few obviously popular shows. But those particular channels are also available to our customers on a variety of other sources like iTunes, Amazon, Netflix, and so on. And they go on to argue that because I can watch Mad Men on Netflix or iTunes, that... AMC is now less valuable to Dish, and so they shouldn't have to pay extra for it. Um, I mean, I can't speak to whether or not it justifies uh, a, a fee, but uh, you know, obviously, the obvious implication is that it's equating old media that's available on Netflix or even iTunes or whatever with with uh, like, look, I mean, people want when they want to watch stuff real time, they want to be all the way caught up with it. So, of course, I mean, I paid for HBO just for the three months while I could watch Game of Thrones. So, I obviously, it's a stupid argument. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just a, it's a negotiating tactic. And I don't think it's going to hold a lot of water with AMC, who is going to point to their ratings and go, yeah, well, it doesn't seem to be reducing the people who watch Mad Men. And let, let's see you get all the folks who like Mad Men and Breaking Bad upset. You, right. You go do that. You have knocked yourself out. That works out for you. Go for it, buddy. Yeah, I think they, they're in a position where they can dare them to try something. All right, just a couple things in tube tops to talk about. This is just rumor stuff, but uh, J.P. Morgan analyst Mark Moskowitz uh, says that Apple TV set may not launch until 2014. Uh, and that instead what we would see is an expansion of the current Apple TV box with a more advanced set-top module sometime next year. Uh, okay. So what you're saying is analyst says that product that Apple has yet to even acknowledge might come later than the other made-up time that we imagined it might show up. I, yeah, I think the more interesting part of this is that they would actually advance the Apple TV set-top box sometime they- next year. I mean, I think they need to. I think the set-top box, I, I'm still angry uh, about where they are with the set-top box and how slow the Apple TV has developed. I mean, I bought mine and I'm, again, like that's, uh, in fact, I, at this point, I'm sort of, jil- I'm a jilted lover with, with Apple. And so now I'm starting to project all that onto what Google TV might be able to do, even though I don't even own a Google TV. So I don't know. Well, you could buy an LG TV. Uh, they plan to launch an internet-enabled TV on, uh, in the States May 21st. That will have Google TV built into it. Hey, I already have a TV, though. If only they had a box. They do. It's called the Logitech Review, and actually it's, it's much better than it used to be. I know, the- but the problem is the Logitech, Logitech Review is so old now. It's well, you like get the I just- Sony one. There's a Sony box, too. 
Well, I know that's well. That's well. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be joining the 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 hangout today, this evening. If you're watching live, uh, right before NSFW, I'm going to join the hangout. We got uh, uh, actually Eileen is is running the thing. Eileen we got, Rivera, yeah, I heard of her. Yep, David Prager, Ron Richards, Rob DeMillo. Uh, yeah, very excited to just talk to him about it. So it's like I find myself somebody who's very excited about this space, but who doesn't own any of the hardware yet. So uh, it'll be fun. I, I'm going to be half there as a consumer viewer. Eva, do you use any set-top boxes for watching um, TV? We use our Xbox for everything because we're, we're cord cut. So, um, yeah, it's the PlayStation for a couple things, and then it's mostly our Xbox because um, I like the, the interface so much. Um, occasionally we'll, even, we'll play games, but most of the time it's for watching Hulu or or Netflix. Um, that's what I was going to ask, like, do you guys use the, the Google TV interfaces or the Apple TV interfaces? Because, like, I have no experience. Like, I know our, our TV is a smart TV, I think, but uh, we've never plugged in, you know, the Ethernet cord or anything because we have our, our Xbox to do everything for us. I mean, the main thing I'm excited about is the ability, because, of course, on Xbox, it's great for, for Netflix, but you for any kind of search, it's so tedious and frustrating. Uh, I, I'm really excited about being able to bring, you know, I'm a video sharing kind of guy. And as I'm hanging out, I'll oftentimes be like, oh, you haven't seen this? Let me show you this and, and start curating this sort of um, live production with my friends. But you have to do that in the office in front of a PC where there's an actual keyboard. If there's a way to do that in the living room, I would love to do that. The one I use the Logitech Review. And the Roku box the most often. Uh, and the review I use because it's in the bedroom, and it's the only set-top box in the bedroom. And mm -hmm. it works most of the time. It's a little buggy. I was having problems getting it to launch Netflix the other day. Like, just randomly, it it, it, it won't launch, and i got to reboot the box, and then it's fine. Uh, well, and that's because I hear, I hear that about the review. And we've talked about this before, how I perceive it with no justifiable reason. Just from what I've heard, I perceive yeah. it perceive it as underpowered compared to an Xbox. So that's why I'm holding off on buying one until there's, there's newer hardware. Let's move on to Film Found. Amazon is looking for comedies and kid shows, uh, apparently. Uh, just like they've done with movies in the past, Amazon Studios is now focusing on some television shows. Uh, they would like writers to submit pitches. Uh, they will uh, accept those scripts. Uh, if they want to give you an option, they'll give you a little bit of money. Uh, and then if they pick up the option and turn it into a series on Amazon, they'll give you uh, a full-on contract with not only money but a, a cut of the merchandise and all that sort of thing. Uh, this is really, really smart just because uh, the, uh, as I've seen with kids, kids love watching repeat programming the Internet is perfect for repeat programming because once you have an ecosystem and the kids can just keep watching the same series over and over and over again, as I've watched my kids with Netflix, just nonstop My Little Pony Friendship is Magic for the last three weeks. Uh, this is the right place for them to focus because also the, it's it's un, underserved. We've not heard a lot of focus on this segment from any of the other big players, right? What, what do you mean? Well, I mean, we haven't we haven't heard Netflix's announcements hasn't been that we're focused on kids entertainment. Oh, Who, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that is the right place to to do it. Well, and I I see this as the broader trend of you know again a couple of years ago when we started Frame Rate we were saying like ah oh, but you know there's all this web content what are, what are the studios doing they're stupid they they should be moving their stuff online and getting people to watch it get as many eyeballs as possible and the argument then was like yeah but what else are they going to do they have no choice. And I said, and we both said, if they wait too long, internet companies will start making their own programming, and it will yep. get better and better and better. And so we're at that stage right now where it's still they're making their own programming, and the established studios can say, yeah, but you know, Lilyhammer, it was good, but it was actually made by a Norwegian television company, and and it's not like anybody's subscribing to Netflix just to get Lilyhammer. And okay, so Amazon's going to get a bunch of people who couldn't get their scripts picked up in Hollywood to make some shows. They'll be okay. They'll be better. But that that argument is going to get thinner and thinner as this goes along because Especially somebody who got overlooked by Hollywood actually had a hit idea, and Amazon or Netflix or Hulu or somebody are going to get picked up, and it's going to be huge. Especially as Google drops two hundred million more dollars, that will essentially legitimize not only their content on YouTube but web distribution as as the whole. And then you've got the idea of studios actually taking the content that they make and putting it online. And everybody's got their eye on Epics. 
Because HBO has said, we're not going to do that. We're going to authenticate. We're not going to take any of the stuff we make and put it online, except when it serves people subscribing to HBO through the traditional models. But Epic's has sort of looked like maybe they would move out of just partnering with Netflix and, and, and having a, a Roku app. Maybe they might just go direct to the Internet. And uh, they just announced, remember this is owned by Paramount, MGM, and Lionsgate. They just announced that the Avengers and Hunger Games will be coming to the Epic's TV and streaming services. They won't be sending them out onto the HBOs of the world. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this is uh, I've never used Epix. Maybe I just need to jump on and use it. It's a pay service, right? Uh, well, I mean, Epix has a partnership with Netflix, so this means the Avengers and Hunger Games uh, could possibly show up on Netflix and not on HBO. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, it also is is an app uh, that you can subscribe to, and it's a television channel uh, that is not on a whole lot of services, but it's out there. God, what a weird mix up of everything. Well, it's not, it's not weird at all, actually. It's exactly the same thing that Stars does, except Stars well, backed out of its Netflix it's, service. It's confusing enough, and it's confusing when I think about Stars. It's like, uh, What's well, confusing a consumer, about it to you? I, think, I want my things to be simple, Tom. I want, I want my channels to be a channel. I want my content distribution partners to be content distribution. Like, it's, there's, there's kind You're of thinking uh, about it too much. Hood and over the hood. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of under, mixing up of the under the hood aspect. Eva's laughing at you. <laughs> well, because I mean, in, in the long run, like everybody's already involved in everything anyway, so um, it makes perfect sense. I mean, you want you want the studios to move forward in the future and embrace the internet. So this is what they're kind of trying to do. Like, well, okay, now we'll stream it and we'll make this deal with Netflix, and we have a channel because we can't abandon our old style. Like, there's people who still use that and depend on it. So um, I know. But but like I don't I don't want to know any of this. I don't want to know all this. I mean, you're right. All of this. There's all these agreements and cross co-fungulation and it's like i don't i don't want to know none of it i want it simple That's well but this is simpler that's why i don't understand i think you actually only know this because you're hosting this show <laughs> most people are just seeing like oh there's epics and they have the avengers and hunger games or they will see oh netflix has the avengers now they right. won't have to know any of it so it's my own fact it's my own fault for looking behind the curtain maybe maybe a All little right. bit because this is simpler this is simpler than Lionsgate saying okay we're going to take avengers and we're going to shop it out and hbo gets it for two weeks and then it's going to move on to stars and then then it's going to go to broadcast and then it's going to go to the airplanes and you know I'm, i've got the order wrong in the way that usually goes but that's the way it usually goes and what epix is saying is like, we're going to make it simpler for you brian brushwood you want to watch the avengers you're going to get it through epix and any any place that partners with it so you Done. just look for the Avengers. Don't Great. you worry that's about thanks, it. That's thanks to Paramount because they're the ones who have the those distribution rights based on the old Marvel Disney deal. So thanks, Paramount. So yeah, give Paramount a little props there. <laughs> Good job. Uh, speaking of the Avengers, let's yeah. move on to checking in on the summer movie draft. It was a slightly disappointing week. I didn't quite overtake Scott Johnson in one blow. In one weekend? Oh, my God. But I am uh, now ranked second with $219 million. Don't forget, $12 million of that is the Raven. I'm on your heels, lockout. I'll tell you what. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick. That's going to be my one sticky point. You're going to trounce me. But I'm going to be like, yeah, but uh, lockout did better than the Raven. And I bought if that's. <laughs> But meanwhile, Can't. I was laughing at you for your $63 on the Avengers, the most expensive movie in the entire draft. And, uh, of course, it's breaking records. So the big question is now, uh, you, you are looking ahead to The Dark Knight Rises. Do you feel different about it now after? Are you breathing a sigh of relief? No, I'm not breathing a sigh of relief. I've, I've gone from saying... Well, DKR is going to outgross the Avengers for sure, but it should be close enough that it's going to be made up on my secondary movies to saying, huh, the Avengers might actually outgross Dark Knight Rises, but it's still going to be close enough that it's going to be made up on the secondary movies. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, I think that after watching the movie, and we'll talk about this in the spoiler zone, but after watching the movie, I think there's tremendous rewatchability to the Avengers, which I did not anticipate. And I think that you will have a very long tail on this. I think it's going to re remain number one at the box office for a while. Uh, next week is when begins my run of four movies. So for the, uh, slightly more than your one Avengers, I bought Dark Shadows, The Dictator, Battleship, and Men in Black 3. 
My goal, of course, being that one of those will perform better than expected uh, and, and at, the, at the value. So the question is, the four of those combined, will they make as much money as the Avengers? And I'm hopeful at this point. The buzz, see, I'm seeing a lot of promotion for Dark Shadows and The Dictator. And, uh, and of course, you know, Battleship they've been promoting for, say, for half a year now. I think uh, yeah, Battleship and Men in Black are your two keystones. Uh, I yep. think Men in Black probably more so. Battleship is probably not going to make the money that it should make with all the promotion behind it, but it'll, it'll do decent enough for you. But I think Men in Black is the one that I have the biggest question mark on. Like, it could yeah. go huge and actually push you over the top, or it could underperform and drag you down. Well, this will be my make-or-break month for sure. Now, the one thing I have really going for me is that Men in Black, of course, uh, Will Smith is a consistent box office draw, but more importantly, this is on a holiday weekend. So whether or not that works out for me or not, I don't know. Like, I, if, if, if The Avengers is still number one come, uh, come holiday weekend, I'm, in, I, I'm done. I got the, the, you know, the other thing is the amount of children in the audience when I went to see The Avengers. It was packed uh, with kids. Even do, you, do you think that families are going to take their kids out to see Dark Knight Rises? Uh, probably not so much. So it seems so dark and heavy. It's not nearly as family friendly. So, like that's that's one of the biggest benefits of of Avengers. It's light and fun, and everyone wants to see it, and you can have a good time. I, I, yeah, I don't see that quite working in Dark Knight's favor. Also, the dictator is getting starting to get some good positive buzz, which you have. Is it positive buzz? Yeah, I've started to see some articles like, "Oh, check out this viral video. This looks funny." People well, are starting to pay a little attention to it. I mean, even uh, even Bruno, when it didn't do well, made a decent chunk of change. So if it does just as Bruno move money, I'm happy. You're just wanting Bruno money. I, like I just yeah, I just want Bruno to give me. <laughs> Let's uh, check in on what we're watching. What we're watching. So we all watch the Avengers, and we'll save that for a little spoiler zone segment at the very end. Uh, but real quickly, uh, starting with you, Eva, because since you're our guest, what are some of the other things you've been uh, watching? Uh, well, besides the Avengers, uh, we watch. We've been caught up mostly on Revenge, which is like a total guilty pleasure. Like uh, it's just fun to watch. Um, you know, the girl Emily getting her her revenge on all these super rich people. Um, so it's it's a lot of fun to watch. What channel's um, Revenge on? Um, or where do, you, I don't know. where do you watch it? I think it's an ABC show. Yeah, it's an ABC show. So, uh, but we watch it on Hulu. Like everything is on Hulu in this house. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a lot of, of fun. And uh, there's there's a little dip when they you could kind of tell like they were working towards the end of the season, and then they sort of it was like either somebody said, "Oh, you get more episodes," or you have to speed things up because the thing that you thought was going to be the end of the season has sort of scooted in. But um, it's definitely picked back up a bit, and uh, it's a lot of fun to watch. And then um, we're watching Game of Thrones, but we're behind by, like, three episodes. So. so you'll be cutting out early on the spoiler zone for sure. Did you read the books? Uh, no, I've been meaning to. I, I got them on Audible, actually. Um, but it's just a matter of uh, I go through cycles of, like, podcasts and the books and music. And so I haven't gotten back to that. So, so uh, aside from Sons of Anarchy and Game of Thrones, what are you watching, Brian? Uh, well, of course, Legend of Korra, I'm continuing to watch. And, and in fact, I just watched uh, this week's episode this morning. Uh, and it's, it's, I love just how mature and adult it is. It's clearly written for college age audiences, which I think is so interesting that it's, it's only on Nickelodeon because it's a, 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 of its legacy of having been from there. But yeah, of course, uh, Avengers, uh, Sons of Anarchy, continuing to plow through. And we'll talk about Game of Thrones. Yeah, we will. Uh, I have pretty much been watching the same things as y'all. Uh, Sherlock premiered on PBS. This Sunday. Now, this uh, all, all the folks in the UK are like, "What? You're just getting it now?" But if you didn't pirate it, you can did, now watch it legitimately on television. Did so you George, just now watch it? Huh? Yeah, I, just, I waited. I waited and watched and? it on PBS. I How? haven't watched the first episode yet because we had so much going on on Sunday, and it didn't air until nine o'clock. And we had to watch Mad Men and Game of Thrones. That's, and then that's last that's... night I had to be on some podcast called Weird Things, so I didn't have time to watch it last night. Uh, and, I w and we were interviewing the authors of the Mongoliad for uh, Sword and Laser. So I can't complain. I've been doing some awesome stuff. Uh, right. but it's nice to know that, ooh, I've got that saved up for tonight. I'm going to shoot the next episode of Sword and Laser, head home, and we're going to, like, dig our heels into Sherlock. I've been waiting for so long. I can't wait. That first episode, dude, you are, you are not prepared. It's so good. Ooh, so great. I'm not prepared. <laughs> uh, I also, for autopilot, watched Buck Rogers on, uh, on uh, Netflix. Watched, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, 
What? How did that hold up? Oh, well, listen to autopilot. Actually, it held up pretty well. Um, I, I was surprised how well. Gil Gerard, Nathan Fillion. A lot of overlap in personality there. Yeah. That I, that I would I not have expected. Uh, also, Emergency, uh, the, the show Emergency. Watch the pilot of that, although that is not available for streaming. You have to get it on DVD. And Sequest DSV, <laughs> available on Netflix for streaming, but it disappeared Friday night. So Friday, I'm like, okay, got to watch this for autopilot. There it is, ready to go. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head out, watch the Avengers. When I come home, I'll watch that. I got home. It's no longer available for streaming. Saturday, no longer available for streaming. Sunday, it was back. Huh. So just for the weekend, it was a fake out. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't, under, I don't understand how that happens. That's a, that's a weird oddity. Uh, so I ended up finding it because I was like scrambling, like I have to watch this because we're recording autopilot on Sunday. I ended up watching it on some, uh, I think like todo.net or one of those uh, Chinese streaming sites uh, <laughs> where they interrupt it with advertisements for diamonds that you buy <laughs> at tukfuk.com or something. It was, it was crazy. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't had to do that to watch something for like five years, you know, with Netflix and Hulu and everybody providing legitimate ways to watch something. Uh, yeah. That was pretty weird. So let's move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Joshua Langston writes, I'm happy that one of my all-time favorite TV shows, Supernatural, is available for instant streaming on Netflix. Along with being a show about two brothers crisscrossing the country fighting monsters, it also has a repeated theme of having classic rock songs like songs from ACDC, Def Leppard, and Boston in the soundtrack. I'm such a huge fan of the show that I've seen the original aired episodes and even owned a few seasons of the DVDs, but I'm noticing on the streaming version that classic rock songs are replaced by generic, unrecognized tunes. Does Netflix not get the musical rights to certain recording artists for shows they stream instantly. Now, I feel like we've talked about this kind of thing before, but uh, but definitely, I mean, I've had that experience where I've w shown something to someone else and it should be, shouldn't make a difference that like one song is is different, but man, does it really affect your viewing experience? I have actually run into this uh, in doing autopilot where pilots come out on DVD and the distributor, the production company doesn't have the rights. They sign the rights for the broadcast, but not the rights for DVD. And so my guess is, without knowing anymore, that Supernatural probably has the rights for these songs for DVD and broadcast, but not for digital streaming. And so the music company said, oh, well, you didn't negotiate for digital streaming rights. So if you give it to Netflix, you have to change the music. Yeah, that's really bizarre. I mean, it just, it just seems wrong somehow. It's like you made the thing. The painting is done. And now it's like if you show this painting in this gallery, you can't. That that tree is my tree. You got to you got to put it. You got to put a sycamore there instead. You want the next one? Next email? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Richard writes, have you guys ever considered adding a segment for cord cutters focusing on alternative content? Too often cord cutting is about how to get standard programming, network and cable shows, without a cable subscription. What about alternative programming? This is especially true for niche programming like Twit, Twitch, uh, video game streaming, podcast, and YouTube. Uh, I think the reason we haven't talked about it is because you, you're you here. You found the castle. Clearly, you know this magical land of, of internet television because you're in our castle. I, uh, I, I, have, I have definitely thought of this a lot. Film Found, our segment Film Found, is all about things to watch. And yes. we put things in there based on how much buzz they get, how much people are talking about. So if it's a quality program, uh, then it doesn't matter where it comes from. Is it NBC or is it YouTube or is it some indie? We put it in there. And we do put alternative uh, movies and TV shows or web video in there quite a bit. In fact, uh, back in December, we did an entire episode about the IAW TV Award nominees where we gave you all kinds of great content uh, to go out and seek on the web. But, you know, if we go in there and just do a segment that's forcing it down your throats, a lot of people aren't going to like that either. So w my th philosophy is when the web content is as good as the TV content, I'm going to be agnostic. I don't care where it comes. I'm all about watching the best stuff on the Internet, and I don't care who makes it. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. It's a good point. All right. Uh, finally, Josh says, Brian thought the way of the future was Hollywood blockbusters would be a thing of the past. Avengers. 
That's a, <laughs> I'm, I'm summarizing, but that's, no, that's, essentially that's what he pretty said. much verbatim it. Um, look, that's that's clearly not what I said, and it's not it was not my intention. My intention, my what I said was is that the model of relying on creating crap and marketing the hell out of it so it's a do or die deal. See, you say Avengers as proof that it works. I'm going to say John Carter as proof that it ain't going to work and that the gambles are going to get bigger and they're unsustainable, especially considering that so much high quality content is going to be made so much cheaper. We're going to see more District 9s and fewer Avengers and, and John Carters. <laughs> Eva, you well, think about the thing about movies like District 9 and like Monsters and like is those movies were uh, directed by people who were familiar, uh, very familiar with how visual effects works. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a visual and, um, effect. Her cat jumped up on her lap. It was a CG cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so they're very familiar with how uh, visual effects works. And so um, I think um, in Hollywood, there tends to be a lot of, of waste. And this is something that's talked about in the post industry a lot. Um, you know, things are constantly being uh, revised. And, you know, you always have issues with, you know, client comments and other, every, like, lots of stuff stacks up that, that you end up um, having to either fix a lot of work or redo a lot of work that um, ends up costing a lot more money and a lot more time. Um, with these small movies where, where people who, who are familiar with the process, at least to some, some intimate level, like, like they understand how everything works, they can shoot and, and direct and plan ahead um, to work within their budget and make something that looks absolutely amazing. And they focus on their story and, and really have the visual effects service the story so that something that's rewatchable or that brings people out that may not necessarily um, do that for, you know, something like John Carter or any of those other movies that are huge but end up just not doing as well as we'd hope. Right. Uh, that's good insight. Thank you, Eva. All right, that's going to be it for uh, this edition of Frame Rate. We are going to do a f spoiler zone here. Uh, if, so, you know, if you don't want to be spoiled on the Avengers, uh, stop watching right now, and we'll see you next time. On frame rate, you can find us on the web twit.tv slash fr or email us frame rate at twit.tv. We'll see you next time. Unless you're picking up. So we only left ourselves like five minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, look, we'll just have to say the long and short of it. Uh, Eva's still here with us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, Avengers, the Avengers was an unbelievable triumph that did things that I did not believe a modern day superhero movie could do. It was a constant fencing match with my adult cynicism where it would every time my adult cynical mind would want to think about what could or couldn't happen or what was or wasn't believable or realistic, the movie would sidestep and, and judo me to where I suddenly bought everything. It was, I felt so respected as a fan of the comic books and of somebody who doesn't like uh, cheesy crap in, their, in his action movies. It was magical. My face literally hurt from grinning the entire time. It was amazing. What do you think, Eva? Uh, I agree. It was an awesome movie. Um, I think uh, part of it is you have this, you know, I mean, you have really awesome visual effects, so don't get me wrong, but you have um, just amazing writing of it's funny, but also serious, and, like, the group dynamics in the, in the film were awesome. Like, you, all the, these great little throwaway lines that are just hilarious and, and you buy it from every character um, and, and no character w was really like unnecessary or, or at least like you didn't feel like oh well they're just extra like like Black Widow was given purpose like just very very nicely done. And, and I mean you guys are Joss Whedon fans you know like Joss Whedon does very well with this sort of overarching group dynamic uh, kind of show anyway so it's, it's great to see yeah, I yeah. almost feel like uh, Buffy and Firefly are training ground for the Avengers because oh, in both uh, cases, he well, Buffy particularly, he learns how to handle multiple uh, strong characters. 
right? I mean, some people would have taken Buffy the Vampire Slayer and made that show continually about Buffy all the way through. And he... You see him start to branch out as you watch the different seasons and saying, you know what, actually, we're going we're gonna to make a Xander story. We're going we're gonna to give Willow a lot more to do. And then, obviously, Firefly, right from the get-go, he's like, yeah, Mal's the main character, but we're going to balance this out. We're going to move between all these different characters and weave them around. And it was so brilliantly done in Avengers, where you never felt like one character was dominating, even though I think, in a, in a way, you can argue this is Black Widow's story. You never felt like, oh, I'm getting Black Widow shoved down my throat. Or, oh, I haven't seen the Hulk. Wait, why are, why are we not seeing the Hulk? Everybody gets just enough. Like, just when you th- are starting to think, well, where are they? They pop up. There's, there's a nice pairing of people up, but then you don't always have the same two people together. I, I, what do, you, do you guys think that he should get best director? I oh, mean, 100%. I mean, it was, it, 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 it's phenomenal. It's, it's what a difficult... First of all, you have the cartooniest of, of uh, the comic bookiest of franchises, and he made it work in a believable way. He also... I thought the, the actor who was playing uh, Bruce Banner, is it, is it Mark Ruffalo? Is that who it is? Mm-hmm. Uh, was phenomenal. He may be the best Bruce Banner ever that I've, that I've they seen. They finally I'm, found their Bruce Banner, I know. Yeah, he was, he was great. Uh, and then uh, the way they're able to... Um, uh, or I guess the other oh, crap. Yeah, I, I'm I'm just too many things I want to say that are that are nice about it. Oh, the the writing was brilliant too. It was written like a comic book where everything was. It was a collage of these ninety second chunks where you could almost see the, J- Joss Whedon writing it with the intention of this being three maybe four panels where it's like you only have this long. You got to get in. You got to make your point. You got to set this idea up, and then you got to. But but it's got to be. You know, it's got to have some zing to it to where you care about that moment. And this constant collage, I was, it, there was not a single miss in that entire movie. Every segment was interesting and good. I thought uh, it was good seeing the guy who played um, uh, Loki. I thought he did a great job. Uh, yes. Although he looked, his grin looks like Andrew Maine's grin, which messes with me. <laughs> did you notice that? Uh, no, I haven't seen Andrew grin enough, I guess. All right, well, I'll, I'll find somebody. Somebody right now in the chat room is going to find a picture of Loki and a picture of Andrew Maine and separated them at birth. Do you think uh, Whedon has a, a, even an outside shot of winning Best Director for a comic book movie? Oh, that's hard. The the Academy is is <laughs> can be. Um, they like to play favorites sometimes. It seems so. Um, it would be a great uh, a great hope. I know Marvel is really hoping that um, the Academy will be very generous to them this year. So. Um, Ideally, uh, you know, it'll at least achieve some awards. And I know they've got big plans for the future. So uh, we'll see where all this goes. And if not this time around, you know, maybe one of the next ones. I think uh, the, uh, the interesting thing about whenever I, I say, like, in some ways they think this is Black Widow's story, what happens is people say, no, 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 this is Captain America and Iron Man story. <laughs> and then other people are like, no, 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 this is, this is really the final best telling of the Hulk story. And, and I think that is emblematic that, in fact, none of us are right. It's the Avengers story, and that is the only, that is the reason that this movie is so good, and and people are enjoying it so much. Yeah, I remember the other thing I wanted to share was of all the the Avengers, the most problematic for me was always Hawkeye. It's like, is a guy with a bow and arrow? How do you how do you sell him? And the re- the way you do is make him a villain for half the movie, <laughs> where, where exactly. you're, and you're like, holy crap, this guy is a badass. Is I can't wait to watch it again. All right, we're going to spare Eva the Game of Thrones spoilers because we're out of time anyway. Uh, But Eva, thank you again so much uh, for joining us. Yeah, no problem. And uh, that's it for the Spoiler Zone. We'll see you later, buddy. Bye-bye.